you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Wednesday, November 23rd edition of the show. I am, in fact, your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at Gary W-E-C-E. Excuse me, W-C-E. Uh, hopefully everybody's having a good Thanksgiving week thus far. Wanted to get in with uh, our preview, maybe hit on a few news topics that uh, we just have not had time to discuss thus far this week. So we want to go ahead and make sure that we are, you know, on top of these things. And uh, and we are going to start that today. Let me go on and start off by telling you that the show is powered by BetUS. It is America's premier online sports book. Highly recommend that you go and check it out. You can, of course. Click on the link in the description. You can get a $50 free play for signing up, and you don't even have to make a deposit. Just throwing it out there. Just throwing it. You, you want a little bit to gamble with over the Thanksgiving week? Of course, there's plenty of NFL, plenty of college football. I would highly recommend going and doing that. They are America's favorite online sports book since 1994. Go ahead and check them out. BetUS. I, of course, host the BetUS College Football Show. It's always a good time. Every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, obviously, today is Wednesday. Not having a show today because it is the Thanksgiving week, and we do have a crew and everybody that wants to go see their families. Totally understand that. Those guys are awesome, and we will be back next week with two shows, just like usual. And as we get into bowl season, two shows a week all the way through New Year's. So a lot going on over there. Make sure that you subscribe to the Bet U.S. College Football Show. Uh, we're also brought to you by Flow Sports. There's a link in the description. Go and make sure that you get signed up. Of course, D3 football is going on right now, along with a ton of other sports. They do MMA over there. They've got rugby. They've got soccer. They've got everything else that you could possibly uh, want, really. But Flow Sports is awesome. I have uh, I have checked it out. I have vetted this, and it is really, really cool. So go ahead and click the link in the description to make sure that you take advantage of what they got going on over there. Now, let's begin this thing by talking about Lane Kiffin. What was with the Twitter reaction just the other day, I think it was Monday, uh, between him and John Sokoloff? I believe that's the guy's name from uh, uh, from a Columbus news station. And, of course, that guy uh, tweeted out that he's got sources that are confirming that Lane Kiffin will step down as Ole Miss's head football coach on Friday, and he is heading to Auburn to take that job. Now, I don't think it would be super surprising for anybody if he were to take that job. However, the way that this broke, you know, this is the guy that it did break the news that John Cohen was going to Auburn, from everything that I understand. But, eh, this is, you know, in Columbus, you are much closer to Starkville. Uh, you're not close to Ole Miss. So, eh, I'm I'm a little confused because if Kiffin was going to actually leave, I don't know why he would come out so harshly against this guy. Uh, and it's not that it was harsh. Obviously, he was he was playing with him because he did send out a tweet after that. He was like, this is news to me. And then he sent another one that was a carbon copy of what uh, John had tweeted out. And he had put in, of course, if you're listening to this, you're a college football fan, you've probably already seen this. But Kiffin then tweeted out a carbon copy of the guy's report, but it had John has taken, or John is planning to step down Friday from WCBI in Columbus and is going to take over in Oxford and da 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 da. Right? It's just it's making it up, and and that's what Kiffin is saying this guy is doing. Now, do we think that maybe there's information in this report that was incorrect, like? I don't think he would step down on Friday immediately after the Egg Bowl. Uh, I think he would probably wait until Sunday for all of this stuff to go on because the Auburn job uh, is, is, I mean, it's open right now, but they're not going to do that to Carnell Williams, I don't believe, before the Iron Bowl. They're not going to announce Lane Kiffin as the new head coach on Friday and then have the game on Saturday. That's absurd. Now, the other part of this is maybe, maybe this is all just a smokescreen. And none of it matters, right? Like, this played perfectly. Somebody told John down at WCBI 
And he shared it out, and it became like this big media firestorm while Auburn is actually making other dealings in the background, right? That's what I'm guessing is going on because I don't think that something that looks this easy on the surface would actually happen. There's just no way. Like, I, I don't buy it for even a second. So I would imagine my thought process is Lane is probably going to stay at Ole Miss this year. I think he's going to get a fat new contract, and uh, we'll see what happens in the Egg Bowl. We will see. All right, next topic on the docket. The Rose Bowl is apparently the only thing that is delaying college football playoff expansion. In order to have college football playoff expansion early, they have to have all six of their major bowl partners unanimously agree to move forward with a new 12-team model for the CFP. The only one that has not done that thus far is the Rose Bowl. And the reason for that is they are asking for a an exclusive time window on New Year's Day going forward. Not just in 2024 and 2025, which are the last two years of, uh, of this deal. They are asking for going forward with whatever the new deal is. But the powers that be don't even know what it's going to look like for 2026 and beyond. And that's the crazy thing. They have got this thing so twisted because they what, what irritates me about the Rose Bowl is that they want to shout about tradition and exclusive time windows at January 1st you know, in that specific afternoon time window when the sun is setting down over the uh, Gabriel Mountain, whatever, right? Which is all fine and good. It all looks great. And don't get me wrong. I am a stickler for tradition. I appreciate uh, the way that things used to be done. I certainly do. However, we don't know what the college football calendar is going to look like going forward. This thing could start a week earlier. It could start, or it could end the regular season on Thanksgiving weekend. Or no, no, excuse me, before Thanksgiving weekend. The championship games could be on Thanksgiving weekend. Like, there's all kinds of things that could end up happening here. And the Rose Bowl wants them to, hey, you know, I know everything else is going to be crazy, but we need our time slot on January 1st, right there at, what, 4 o'clock Eastern or whatever it is. How can you possibly guarantee that to somebody when you don't know what the next deal is going to be? When you don't know what the calendar is going to look like going forward? That's impossible. That's ridiculous. On top of that, you're looking at guaranteeing a time slot for what could be... And and this is regardless of whether the Rose Bowl is included with the CFP or not. Like if it's a semifinal, if it's whatever... They want this exclusive time window, even if it's like the Big Ten's number three against the Pac-12's number four or whatever it is. This all has to do with money. Like, that's what's so crazy to me is that nobody, nobody's really paying attention to the fact that the Rose Bowl is really out to just get money. That's <laughs> That exclusive time window is an incredibly valuable property. Like, we understand that. But this is just mind-blowing to me, when you read all these things, because they don't understand how to read the room at all. They don't get what they're actually doing to this sport. And now, obviously, the CFP has given them a deadline. And if they are the ones that delay this thing that is widely popular, this uh, this CFP expansion, well, I mean, that's going to be on them. And we will see uh, how the public reacts, etc., uh, but they keep talking about having to have it just uh, however long after the parade and et cetera, you know, at the exact time, et cetera. Uh, they didn't complain about that when they were getting BCS national titles out there. They hosted two of them. Probably the most memorable game that's ever been played in that stadium was USC in Texas, and that was played on January the 4th at night. There was no sunset. Like, what are we talking about? Like the whole thing is just mind blowing to me when when you really sit down and look at it. But yeah, we're, we're gonna see what the Rose Bowl ends up doing. But as time goes on, like the Rose Bowl not being able to work with or not being willing to work 
with the college football playoff uh, committee or whatever it may be, I, it has soured me on that game quite a bit over the years. It certainly has. Next thing on the board, the SEC is moving away from divisions. Uh, Greg Sankey kind of let it leak. He said they're certainly leaning that way. Uh, here, They're not doing pods. They're not going to do four-teamers. They're not going to do you know, anything like that. No, no three teams. They'll do probably some permanent opponents, but they still haven't decided on eight-team schedule or nine-game schedule or well, whatever it may be. I would imagine it's probably going to be nine, but obviously kind of up to uh, your TV partners, I suppose. But this, I, I think we're seeing it this year. You see with the Pac-12 exactly how weird the tiebreakers can get when you do this. Yes, you get to play everybody every couple of years, right? That's good. When you get into tiebreakers, like the SEC had their thing figured out early. Like we knew it was going to be Georgia and LSU. So that's no issue. Um, on the other side, you're looking at the AAC, and your tiebreaker is going to come down to, I mean, that's an 11-team conference, and Houston and Cincinnati did not play. So that's going to get weird if Cincinnati ends up losing to Tulane this weekend. It's it's strange. The tiebreakers are going to be weird. Like I feel like there's got to be a better way, and I'm not saying necessarily divisions, but... You know, some type of a pod format has got to make some kind of sense because, man, these tiebreakers are are getting really, really ridiculous. Look at the Pac-12. Washington still has a chance, but they need Oregon to lose and somebody else, UCLA to lose. I I mean, who knows? Who knows what all this is? So you're not going to know until right up until that last weekend, and maybe that's good. Maybe that's what they're actually looking for is, hey, This doesn't have to be decided necessarily on the field. We just want to make sure we get our two highest-ranked teams into the conference championship game. I guess I can't fault them for that. Maybe it's better for TV. I don't know. But it it certainly seems weird that this is the direction that we're going when it was so easy for so long, right? I I guess people are tired of teams like Iowa getting a chance to go play for a Big Ten title uh, with, with that ridiculous offense, I guess. But, I don't know, I, I did not really find fault with the way it was going, and I know it's going to be tougher with 16 teams, but it is what it is. It is what it is. All right, our next thing. The, da, 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 the Pac-12. The Pac-12 is getting 42 to $47 million uh, da, 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 per school. In their next deal, apparently. This was leaked from, uh, I believe, the UC Regents, uh, at least what they were told. They are having a meeting in December to determine exactly what UCLA is going to do uh, going forward. But, and so one, let's talk about UCLA. If UCLA leaves uh, the Big Ten, like if they have to come back to the Pac-12, they owe the Big Ten $15 million. And this is all well and good, and everybody thinks that that's going to be great for the Pac-12, but I don't believe that the Big Ten is just going to sit by and have USC be the only team that they take, right? Like, if if UCLA has to go back to the Pac-12 because of the UC Board of Regents, they're going to come out and they'll get Washington, or they'll get Oregon, or they'll take both. They, there's no telling what they will end up doing if they don't get to keep UCLA, I mean, it could get really, really screwy quickly. So that is something to pay attention to. Uh, but as far as the 42 to $47 million per school that was leaked out, are we talking about that in, a, in just media rights? Like, is that only the TV deal? You know, there's so many questions, so many numbers that have been thrown around out here. I don't know that this is actually legitimate. I found it odd that it was a number that was leaked by the UC Board of Regents, that that's what the Pac-12 is going to end up getting in their next you know, TV deal. Like, is it only media rights, or does it include what they expect from uh, the CFP expansion, you know, NCAA tournament, et cetera? Like, well, what are we looking at for that? So I, who knows? Who knows exactly what that's going to look like? But, yeah, 
This uh, the Pac-12 stuff is getting real screwy. We'll see what that Board of Regents meeting looks like. Uh, they're having a special session. Uh, I think the second week of December to determine whether or not they're going to let UCLA go. And I think at this point you kind of have to. I, I mean, there's there's no point in bringing them back. So, regardless. Next thing up, and and then we'll hit a short break before we jump into the previews for next week. Uh, but Mark Stoops got a contract extension uh, at Kentucky. Now, this is, you know, nice, good things. But it does feel like they attempted to hide this thing, which is really funny. You don't see SEC football schools uh, or SEC schools in general hiding contract extensions for their coaches. They typically want to publicize that as much as possible. And yet, this extension, which is $9 million per year through 2031, it was signed right before the Vanderbilt game. So they lost the Vandy game. Then they lose to Georgia. And then it was actually made public, which was after the loss to Georgia. I guess only losing by 10 to Georgia is uh, viewed as a win, I guess. Uh, but there's a chance that they could end up losing to Louisville as well. So three straight losses in the year, definitely not what you want to do. And I, I have heard rumblings that there will be some coaching changes up there. And and not with Stoops, but I don't think he's happy with the way that things have gone this year, obviously. But, uh, but yes. I mean, you had Chris Rodriguez, you had Will Levis this year, and things did not go well. They certainly did not. But either way, uh, he, he got a, a nice new deal, and that continues to be maybe one of the best jobs in all of college football because of the expectation level, the rollover contract whenever you win seven games, which they have to beat Louisville to get to seven wins. I, I think he's got it pretty easy, and I think he's going to stay there now at least until the Iowa job opens, which Kirk Ferentz might live forever. So who knows? So, all right, let's uh, let's hit this ad. On the backside, we're going to talk about where game day is going for championship week. We're going to talk about the highest rated games for this coming week, the most exciting games, double-digit underdog that could win outright, et cetera, et cetera. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back. Bet US TV has you covered every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff. Only on the Bet US TV College Football Channel. Visit WinningCuresEverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let's get back into this. Uh, make sure that we are actually recording. That's always good. All right. Where is college game day going for championship week? And we've only got a couple of options here, so let's just let's roll right through this. Um, they could go to the Big Ten championship. Now, that's going to be Iowa against whoever, right? And we've already seen Iowa against Ohio State. Uh, well, we've already seen Iowa against Michigan as well. So um, that's not a fun matchup. I imagine that Iowa is going to make it. But we will see. It doesn't sound super appealing. Uh, Clemson versus North Carolina. That's the ACC championship game. It's in Charlotte. Uh, it's a fun matchup. It's obviously a really fun uh, uniform game, I think. But, eh, UNC just lost to Georgia Tech. We'll see what happens with Clemson against South Carolina. This is It's going to be a top 20 matchup, I think. North Carolina, I think, has to beat NC State this weekend. Like, for morale purposes, right? But North Carolina, I mean, I think that they could probably put some points on Clemson, etc. Is it is it the best matchup? Probably not. I think they're going to have to go to LSU 
and Georgia in Atlanta. And they do the SEC championship pretty frequently. But bottom line, I mean, you got two top five teams here. LSU is number five. Georgia is number one. This is a massive, massive matchup. Like, you're going to have a lot of LSU fans hyped up for this game. I imagine they are going to get a win at Kyle Field this weekend. But, yeah, I think that's where you have to go. So my, my guess for game day this weekend is going to be LSU and Georgia in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. That is my that is my guess on this. All right. Which games are going to get the biggest TV ratings this weekend? I think we know what the first one's going to be. Michigan at Ohio State. It might hit 20 million viewers this weekend. Obviously, big noon kick on Fox. It is the perfect time window. It is going to be a massive, I mean, absolutely massive number. So, yeah, Michigan at Ohio State is going to be huge. Uh, Notre Dame at USC that night. That one's going to be on ABC. That one might get close to 15. Like, if it's a close ball game late, uh, with USC being in the playoff hunt, Notre Dame has gotten back up off the mat. I know they've already lost three games, but this Notre Dame team has a shot at nine wins now. Like The fans are back on board, and there's a lot of teams around the country that are hoping that USC falls off so that they can get maybe into playoff contention here. So that's going to be a massive one. Auburn at Alabama on CBS in the afternoon window. That's always going to be a massive time slot. Uh, it did $10 million last year, and that was with a 5-6, and six, I think. I don't know, 6-5, and five, whatever it was, Auburn team. Uh, so long as it's a relatively tight game, yeah, you're going to have a lot of viewers. So that may be somewhere around $8 million or so, uh, so long as it's tight. Oregon at Oregon State. This is the afternoon ABC window. If this one gets tight, this is another one where the Pac-12 playoff, well, excuse me, Pac-12 championship game is in play for the Ducks. Oregon State has been really, really good. This, of course, uh, used to be called the Civil War. Nobody really calls it that anymore, I guess. Um, I don't know why we had to make that change, but regardless, uh, that one could draw a, a huge number of people on Saturday. Florida at Florida State on Friday night. This is the only big ball game on Friday evening, and... I think that it's the perfect time slot for it. Like, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of people tuned in to see exactly what Mike Norvell has done with this Florida State team. Um, and, yeah, obviously people want to see what what's going on down there. I think Dope Campbell Stadium is going to be rocking on that one. And so, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, the number five most watched this week. Baylor at Texas early on Friday. I think there's going to be a huge number of people that tune in to watch that game um, just because it's Texas. I mean, it's a brand that sells, and Baylor uh, obviously can beat them. So that one could be pretty tight. Baylor's defense might be able to do something with B. John Robinson. We'll see. But uh, but Texas plays tight games. That one could be interesting. South Carolina at Clemson. Saturday morning, uh, that's an ABC game as well. It's going up head-to-head with Michigan-Ohio State. So obviously you're not going to have as many people watching. But I think you're still going to get a pretty good number for that, especially if a South Carolina uh, finds a way to keep that thing close to where they've got a shot at an upset late. Like even if you're within like ten points, you can you can get some people interested in that ball game. So we will see. But I think that uh, I think those are going to be your seven top most watched games this weekend. Now, let's talk about the most exciting games of the weekend or which games might be the closest scores. I'm only going to hit on a few of these. Uh, Michigan-Ohio State, I mean, that's pretty obvious. you got number two against number three. Uh, really, you know, passing offense versus rushing offense. Uh, one team is a little bit of flash. The other team is a little more um, brute force, I guess, at strength. You know, uh, that I think that one has a chance to be, one, really, really exciting, and two, really, really close. So, uh, the other one, I, I mean, I already brought up Notre Dame and USC uh, for who's going to get the highest ratings. This is another one with the same setup. USC, real flashy. Notre Dame, a lot of grit. That one could be close. Notre Dame has the ability to sustain drives against USC's defense. They can keep the ball away from Caleb Williams. He can't hurt you if he don't have the ball, right? <laughs> right? 
Uh, Oregon at Oregon State, I think, could be really, really interesting. That one, um, it's a three-point spread here. Oregon State is ridiculous. I think they're 11-0 against the spread in their last 11 at home. That's nuts. I mean, they are so good. So, so good at covering the spread at home. Uh, and when it's only three points, I mean, look, Oregon State won this game in uh, 2020. Like, they beat Oregon. And that was Mario Cristobal's Oregon team. This one's a little bit different. But Bo Nix has hobbled. Like, uh, Goldbrunson, the quarterback for uh, for the Beavers, is pretty good. So this one, I think, could be tight. I think a lot of people uh, will be surprised at how good Oregon State actually is. Jonathan Smith is absolutely doing it in Corvallis. Like, it's years of that guy. Washington, Washington State, the Apple Cup. Of course, this one is on the Palouse. Um, look, the Cougars play a different brand of Pac-12 ball than I think anybody else out there. Washington, they remember what happened last year. Like at Washington State fans, I, I feel like a lot of people didn't pay attention to this. Washington State fans stormed the field in Seattle. That's how empty that stadium was from Husky fans. Like they had all left because Washington State won that game like forty to thirteen last year, and that was that you know it, they they had an interim coach, uh, Jimmy Lake had been fired. It, things just were not looking good. Kalen DeBoer has got this team at nine and two right now. Michael Penix is absolutely dealing, and I this this seems like a perfect spot for revenge. And I know that it's at Washington State. I know it's going to be cold, etc. I don't think it matters. Uh, because I think Washington, the, there's a huge returning production uh, number of, of Washington fans that are not well, fans, excuse me, uh, Washington players that remember what happened last year. When the Washington State fans stormed their own home field after they won that game. So Apple Cup, I think, late on Saturday night could get very interesting. Uh, Tulane and Cincinnati. Can't believe this is the first time I've actually brought this up, but this one could be uh, a really exciting game. Uh, we don't know yet if Ben Bryant, the quarterback, is going to play. It seems like that could be an issue for Cincinnati. Tulane, I expect Tajay Spears to have a pretty big day. I expect uh, Michael Pratt to be able to throw the ball on Cincinnati's defense. This Cincinnati team just has not felt the same this year. And obviously they lost a lot of dudes. But this one's at Nippert. So obviously home field is going to play an advantage here. But man, I... Uh, I think this is going to be really, really exciting. Really like Tulane in that spot. Uh, which teams have the most to gain and the most to lose? That's obviously a pretty big deal here. Thanksgiving weekend. Tulane, Cincinnati, obviously the winner goes to the AAC championship game. Pretty big deal. The next one on who has the most to gain or the most to lose. Oregon at Oregon State. Washington at Washington State. UCLA at Cal. All three of those road teams, um, yes, all three of those road teams are set up to go to the Pac-12 title game, which is absolutely insane, if you really think about it. If these are all of your biggest brands, why are they all playing on the road at the very end of the season? How did, they, how did this schedule turn out this way, right? Like, it, it, I understand the, the rivalries, etc., but... Even still, the fact that they are all on the road, yeah, this is going to get interesting. Uh, but yes, all three of those, Oregon, Washington, and UCLA, are still vying for a chance at the conference title. Notre Dame at USC. Both of these have a lot to gain and a lot to lose. Notre Dame has put themselves in a position to contend for a New Year's Six birth. Who would have thought that? USC, on the other hand, they win this game, and they are, I mean, in the driver's seat for uh, the college football playoff. Like, they still got to win a Pac-12 title. Of course, that's coming up next Friday. But, yeah, that's a that's a big one. Uh, who else has the most to gain? Obviously, there's a lot of teams that are vying for bowl contention, etc. I am going to toss out Western Kentucky at Florida Atlantic. Both of these teams need a win here. WKU would get to go play against UTSA in the Conference USA title game again. And I think that Helton, the uh, the coach there, um, he, one, I've heard that he's trying to get out. 
because he understands what Conference USA is about to become. But also, they need this win to go to the conference title game. Florida Atlantic, I think, needs this game for Willie Taggart, maybe to keep his job. Right? They, things have not gone well down there. But I think this is a wildly interesting game because Florida Atlantic has played significantly better at home. Like, they do not play well on the road for whatever reason. I don't understand the splits. But, yeah, this one I think could be very, very interesting. Who are the most likely 10-plus point underdogs that could win outright this weekend? Who are the double-digit dogs that can win outright? That's our question. Utah State, plus 16.5 at Boise on Friday morning. That's an interesting one. Because Boise has already wrapped up the uh, Mountain West Mountain Division. So they're already going to host the conference title game. What does this game have to do with anything? It's not like it's you're trying to get to a New Year's Six game. It's not like you're trying to up your bowl aspirations, etc. There's a chance that they could just sit guys and try not to get anybody hurt before the championship game. It's entirely possible. Utah State, on the other hand, Eh, there's a, they've won five out of six. The only one that they lost there was when their quarterback was out. This team has been playing a lot better as of late. Interesting spot. South Carolina plus 14 and a half at Clemson. We all saw the Gamecocks last week. We all saw what they did to Tennessee. Clemson's defense is better than Tennessee's. So I don't imagine you're going to see the same thing. But if Spencer Rattler gets a little bit of time, if they can keep that pocket clean, He can throw the football and put it in some spots where defenders cannot get to it. So let's let's just see what happens there. Uh, Coastal Carolina plus 13.5 at James Madison. So there's a little bit of a a look-ahead spot here for Coastal Carolina. Obviously, they have the uh, Sun Belt Championship next week against either Troy or South Alabama. But this is... I think there's a little bit of pride here with Jamie Chadwell. And there's also the idea that Coastal could be playing for a New Year's Six berth, possibly. If they were to win this game and win the Sun Belt, and the winner of the AAC has like three losses, I don't, I, who knows what they're going to end up doing with that. But uh, but yeah, Coastal, they, they've still got a lot to play for. I understand that Grayson McCall, the quarterback, is out. But Guest wasn't awful. And Jamie Chadwell can scheme with the best of them. And I know that JMU has been pretty good here lately. But I say lately. They were really good at the beginning of the season. Eh, They're okay lately. That defense is really, really good. But that offense is, whew. They've had 15 turnovers in the last five games. And that includes zero against Louisville. There you go. UTEP plus 17 at UTSA. Uh, This is another one of those situations where UTSA, I mean, we saw it happen last year. Like, they they got housed by North Texas last year in the very last regular season game, and North Texas was trying to get to a bowl game. Uh, Look at here. UTEP plus 17. UTEP is trying to get to a bowl game. I mean, we got the same situation. It's the same thing. So, yeah, look out for UTEP because I I think – they could really come out fired up, and UTSA might sit some guys. Hawaii plus 15 at San Jose State. San Jose State has not been the same since uh, they had that. Uh, they had a player that passed away due to like a scooter accident or something. I mean, it was really weird. Um, but this team just, they've got talent, but it has not come together. Uh, Hawaii's been playing a lot better as of late. A lot better as of late. So, uh, Hawaii got that win over UNLV last week. And now, granted, that was on the island, but regardless. Uh, Iowa State plus 10 at TCU. You know I had to throw this on, on here. Um, TCU is, yes, playing for a lot right now. But this is one of those spots where TCU has gone through a bit of a gauntlet, and they get back home, and they're playing a team that's only got one win in the conference, and maybe maybe they can just kind of skate by with this one and they won't have to worry too much. It would not shock me to see them lose this game. We have seen it happen before. So 
Iowa State's defense is legit. Now, obviously, Hunter Deckers and, and that bunch on the offense uh, have not been great so far this year, but uh, wouldn't shock me to see Iowa State pulling upset here, even on the road. Tennessee at Vanderbilt. Tennessee is a 14-point favorite. Vandy has won two straight as a two-touchdown dog. Yeah, this is interesting, right? Because Joe Milton now starting a quarterback. What does Tennessee have left to play for other than pride, right? I think a lot of people underestimate pride. I don't know how likely this one is to happen. I think Joe Milton can still fling it. Like, I think Tennessee is still in a good spot. But if they come out and they are lackadaisical and they allow Vanderbilt to throw on that defense again, you know, if they're still missing some guys on that defense, they can't get pressure. Uh, Mike Wright's able to deal a little bit, the quarterback at Vanderbilt. Vandy is trying to get to a bowl game. Vanderbilt's playing with house money. Could you imagine in a year where Tennessee was ranked number one in the CFP, if they were to lose a game at Vanderbilt? I mean, it was just a few weeks ago that they were talking about checkering out uh, Vanderbilt Stadium, or whatever it's called now. Like, it's just a, a strange, strange spot. So, it could happen. It could always happen. All right, last one up for our preview. The G5 game of the week. Tulane at Cincinnati. This is easy. This is It's for the AAC uh, title game appearance. It's to host it. Like, it's a big deal. And the loser may not even be able to get in because UCF is ranked and all these tiebreakers, et cetera. Uh, you know how that goes. And so, yeah, uh, this is for an appearance in the AAC title game. The next one that I've got here, Air Force at San Diego State. Not a lot of people talking about this game. This is a very interesting one. Air Force has not beaten San Diego State since 2009. I mean, it's a very long time. But I think this team might have the goods to be able to do it. So we'll see. San Diego State looks a lot different. The offense has been really, really good under uh, under Maiden. So something to pay attention to. Uh, and then finally, I mean, deeper than hate. we got to talk about that. App State and Georgia Southern. This is Clay Helton's first foray into this. App State, it turns out, still needs to win this game to be able to get to a bowl game. In a season where App State went to Kyle Field and beat Texas A&M, they still have to win the last game of the regular season just to get to bowl eligibility. What on earth are we talking about? Like, How, how did we get to this point? Uh, there's going to be some shakeup at App State because I don't think that they will allow this to happen. But you knew that there was going to be a drop-off from last season, right? I mean, we all knew that. Um, they lost a lot of dudes on that defense last year. And here they are. Like, they're, they're back trying to do, you know, make it to another bowl game, et cetera. But they don't just do bowl games at App State anymore. They, they demand that you be excellent. Uh, and in this new look Sunbelt, you got to maintain. you got to maintain. You can't be losing at home to James Madison. You can't be having to throw Hail Marys on the last play of the game against Troy. You know, I can't be losing to Marshall. Like, <laughs> you you need to step up your game. So we'll see what they end up doing. All right. I think that's going to wrap it up. Uh, go and check out Valtimary Surf Company. These guys are fantastic. They do a lot of wonderful things with college town apparel. And for example, like I've got a couple of Tuscaloosa Surf Company shirts, so go ahead and check them out. ValtimarySurfCo.com. You can use the promo code Gary10, and it's going to get you 10% off of your order. Again, that is Gary10, G-A-R-Y-1-0. And of course, go and check out BetUS.com. If you click the link in the description, which all of these have links in the description, uh, go click on that link, and you can get $50 in free play just by signing up at BetUS. Go ahead and take advantage of that. Listen to me on the BetUS College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. It is on YouTube, and of course, there is the podcast as well. It is the BetUS Football Show. But uh, but yeah, for the most part, really, click the like button here and subscribe to the channel. That certainly helps me out, right? This is my own independent thing, uh, but I like to just talk about this sport. I enjoy this quite a bit, and you guys have made it really, really entertaining for me this year. A lot of fun. Uh, looking forward to continuing on into championship week and bowl season, etc. Hopefully, all of you have wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving holidays. 
Uh, I am done for the rest of the week as far as this show is concerned, as far as BetUS is concerned. But, uh, but Sunday, I'll be back with the reaction show. So hopefully you are already subscribed and you already know what it is that we are going to do. So we will see you on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. With that said, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully, hopefully, all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show. <laughs>